Got to hear that song back to back days. Man, it really blesses you. Thank you so much. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Malachi? We're going to begin reading in chapter 3 and verse 7 in just a moment. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 7. And yes, today's message is on money, it's on giving, it's on tithing. It's not always easy uh, to talk about money. But sometimes money can be a, a laughing matter. Uh, I was reading about an experience that uh, a comedian, Rich Vols, uh, experienced. He went to the bank to deposit money in his account. And the teller responded asking Mr. Vols for his ID. And to that, he said, now, you're telling me that other people are trying to put money into my account and you're telling them no? <laughs> I also like what a man named Merle Wilson had to say about money. He said, if you think nobody cares whether you're alive or not, uh, miss two car payments and you'll find out. <laughs> or then the late great comedian Bob Hope stated about money, he said, a bank is the only place that will lend you money if you can prove that you don't need it. <laughs> but then there are the jokes about church and money. I read the story of a young boy who went to the candy store. The candy store owner was a Christian, an older man who was a Christian. And uh, the boy went and he used his money and he bought candy. And the store owner uh, began to scold the boy and said, you should be giving that money to the church, not buying candy. And the little boy responded, well, I'll buy the candy with the money and you use the money and give it to the church. <laughs> but you know, money is not often a laughing matter. A lot of times we're like that little boy. It's my money. I'm going to do with it what I please. And I really don't need any counsel in that, especially if it has to do with giving money away. But really, by nature, money is a neutral thing. It's neither good nor bad. What really determines the virtue or the lack of virtue in regard to money has to do with the possessor of that money. We can do many good things. We can be obedient with it. We can do many bad things and be disobedient with it. And so today, we're going to look at, uh, again, in Malachi, beginning in verse 7 of chapter 3, God says, Since the days of your fathers, you've turned from my statutes. You have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you ask, how can we return? Will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? You ask, how do we rob you? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions. You're suffering under a curse, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine and your field will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate for you will be a delightful land says the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Fathers, we open your word today. We thank you for the truth of it. We confess to you, Lord, that we're blessed when we learn from your word, from the experience of others, from the times when you've had to chastise your people. And uh, Lord, so we pray you would add to our understanding about money, um, that Lord, um, it is an inanimate object, but many times it reveals, and how we deal with it reveals the state uh, of our hearts. And so, Lord, speak in this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, again, we're looking at Malachi. What a great week it was last week. It was a blessing for me to see one of our youth come back, former youth, and, and preach, and just to see how God is working in so many ways uh, that we don't see maybe every day. But we're, we're returning to Malachi again today. And you remember uh, last time or the last few times we've looked at it, we talked about the fact that Malachi is not only the last book in order of where it is placed in the Old Testament, but it is actually 
actually also the last book chronologically. And so what we have in the book of Malachi is the last revealed word of God in the Bible for about 400 years until the time when Jesus came uh, to this earth. And we see that I'm glad that Revelation ends victoriously as the last book in the New Testament because as we look at uh, Malachi here, there are so many problems in the church here. The Old Testament ends uh, with the hope of the coming of Jesus, but in regard to the people, there was so much disobedience. They were giving half-hearted efforts to the Lord. They were offering second best. The leaders were accepting what was unacceptable to God. They, they were not even aware of their wrongdoing and, and their hearts were divided. And so today we come to the issue of the tithe. And, and all of these problems that the church had were actually problems of the heart. They were not dedicated to the Lord. The Lord was not the priority in their lives. And so it shouldn't surprise us that the issue of money comes up because Jesus said in the New Testament, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That your treasure, what you value, how you use your possessions, those that you've been given stewardship over, reveals your heart. And so today in verse 7, we're going to look at a general problem the church had and God's answer to that. And then we're going to look at the specific issue uh, that God is addressing with the people here in verses 8 through 12. But first I want to look at the general problem. And we see it in verse 7. God is speaking since the days of your fathers. He's speaking not just to the people of those times, but the history of Israel. He said, you have turned from my statutes. You've not kept them. And so the issue here was a matter of the heart. It was a heart of disobedience, that the people had disobeyed God, that there was a pattern of sin in the people's lives. And we need to be wary of the fact that there can be patterns of sin in our life, in the church's life, in individuals' life, that continue to rear their head. Uh, and these unchanged patterns uh, are just an outward manifestation of a problem of the heart. And simply put, the people of Malachi's day, they were disobedient and self-absorbed. In fact, he says, you've turned from my statutes. They did not obey God's instruction regarding the offerings. They did not follow. Not only did the people not follow it, but believe it or not, the priests were accepting what God's word clearly said was unacceptable. They did not regard the laws that God gave in regard to marriage. The priests, they were not leading in a righteous way. And in all of that, they did not doubt themselves, but they doubted God's love. Well, God's instruction was this, return to me in verse seven, and I will return to you. That's very clear. It's very simple, yet so complicated when we get caught up in a self-absorbed life. I'm reminded of the parable of the prodigal son in the New Testament, one of the most familiar parables. And you remember that the younger of two sons came to the father, asked for his part of the inheritance before the father died. He went off into a, a foreign land and he began to be involved in profligate and unrighteous living. And he wasted his money on reckless living. And he got to the point where not only was he serving by feeding the pigs, but he actually longed to eat what the pigs were eating. And then the scripture says that he came to his senses and he went back to his father. And the picture of the father was not one with his arms crossed like this, but a father who was ready to receive the son back in open arms, with open arms. And so as we look at it here, it's like the people in Malachi's day, they were the profligate people. They were spending on themselves. They were spending on the wrong things. They were doing the wrong things. And God is saying, if only you'll be aware, if only you're aware of your sin, then I will receive you back. You see, the journey back to God begins when we realize we have wandered. And then when we turn back to God, the word of God says here that he'll return to us. God's favor had left the people because they were being a poor witness. They were being disobedient. But God is saying 
And we saw last week, at, or the last time we were together, in verse, son, in verse uh, 6, rather, he said, because I have not changed, you've not been destroyed. God was gracious to them. God's gracious to you and me today. If you find yourself in a pattern of sin, if you find yourself in it being negligent to the things of God, God is saying, return to me and I'll return to you. And so we see that that general command applies to so many areas. But then we get to the crux of his message here in the middle of chapter 3. And it deals with the specific issue of this. They were disobedient in their giving. We've already seen evidence of this problem a few weeks ago. Uh, they were disobedient in what they gave to the Lord, and the priests were putting their stamp of approval. Rather than checking it like somebody properly would check a, a, a luggage, a carry-on bag that is going onto a, a plane, rather than being that check to say that's unacceptable, the priests in that day were allowing unacceptable offerings to go through their hands to be offered unto the Lord. When we looked at Malachi chapter 1, we saw that there was a problem in the quality of their giving. They were giving lame animals. They were giving blind animals. They were giving the second best, the broken and the afflicted. They weren't giving their best. Now I'm going to preach a little bit and jump. This is, is a feeling that I have, and you may disagree, and uh, you have a right to be wrong. No, I'm not saying that. No, I'm not. But... I don't believe in churchyard sales. I don't believe in them. Because I don't believe you want to take what you're ready to get rid of, exchange it for money, and then give it to God. I think that's a scriptural principle. A churchyard sale says, take what I have that I really don't want, and, you, and you, I'm going to get money and give it to the Lord. And, and hey, God doesn't like hand-me-downs. And, and uh, so here in Malachi chapter 1, we see there was a problem in the quality of their giving. They weren't giving of the first fruits. They were giving what was left over. But here in Malachi chapter 3, he's speaking not to quality, but he's speaking to quantity. So in chapter 1, he's saying, you're, you're bringing what you yourself really don't want to me. It's a poor quality. Here he says, you're not even bringing the right quantity. You're not giving the amount that you should give. A, a tithe is one-tenth of what one has. Some people would argue that even in the Old Testament, the required giving could be as much as 23% of what one had. There was uh, the tithe of the yearly festival giving, the tithe given to the Levites that was to care for them. And every third year, a tenth, which divided by three would be uh, three and uh, a third percent, or would be given to the poor. Simply put, though, the people in Malachi's day were not giving the amount God expected. And God wasn't happy. He says in verse 8, he says, Well, a man robbed God, yet you are robbing me. The word for rob speaks of not something done discreetly, but just openly and blatantly of taking by force. It wasn't that they were passively indifferent to God. They were openly defiant. And it wasn't a minor issue because number eight of the Ten Commands, Commandments says, Thou shalt not steal. And not only were they stealing, but God said, You're stealing from me. So as they were giving leftovers in chapter one, and they were not even giving the right amount or quantity, as they weren't giving the quality and the quantity, we see that this was what? A thermometer of their hearts. They didn't love God. They weren't showing that God was a priority. Because remember, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it wasn't good. In fact, God was saying in chapter 1, instead of taking this leftover stuff, this yard sale stuff, this stuff that you don't want, instead of doing that, just close the temple doors. And then he's saying here in chapter 3 that their crops were being affected, that God's displeasure was affecting their own abundance. So as we consider this passage, how does it apply to us today? I want to look at basically four truths about our giving that we need to make note of. And the first is this, God owns everything. 
God owns it all. Psalm 5010 says, for every animal of the forest is mine, God says, the cattle on a thousand hills. That and more. That and everything. God is saying there, by saying the cattle of a thousand hills, it doesn't mean that he doesn't own a thousand and one hills. He owns all the hills, but he puts such a big number out there, he's trying to say, it all is mine. And because God owns all, he has authority over all that we have. Not just 10%, but all of it. Because he has sole authority of all, that means that he can expect part. That he can expect the tithe. Owning all gives him authority over the part. The best way I could illustrate that would be the properties of this church. This church has, in man's eyes, the proprietorship of this building, the gym building across the way, and the house that I live in. That is all the church's possession. Yet we have the authority, because all of this is in the church's possession, to give a command over part of it. So we're not going to bring livestock in uh, the Focus Center building because we just put a floor in there and we're not going to mess it up. Now we own all of it and because we own all of it, we can give a specific command about part of it. Don't do that. And so God owns all of it, yet in the command he says a tenth of that is to be given to me. If we would just live understanding that everything we have is of God and from God and given to us for, for time and temporally so we might be good stewards. We'll get this right. God owns it all. But secondly, there is a blessing in giving to the Lord. It is clearly evident here that not only had the people offended God, they were shortchanging themselves. Verse 11 speaks of the devourer affecting their crops. And God says, bring the whole uh, uh, of the tithe in. He said, so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine. In other words, what was happening was this. They were not giving and God was judging them in their situation. Their land was not fruitful. Now, this was their situation. We need to be very careful. Sometimes we try to connect the dots and say, well, if I give to God, then God's obligated to just pour out blessings. I have a friend that went to Bible college one time and a noted speaker came and he shared, he said, uh, I was driving my Cadillac down the road and I saw somebody on a bike. The Lord led me uh, to give my Cadillac to that person. And guess what? The speaker said a week later, I got a nicer Cadillac. Well, some of the students that were listening there, they all decided to give their cars away, not all of them, but a number. And guess what? They walked the rest of the semester. Why was that? Their motivation was wrong in giving. Their heart wasn't right. They were giving just to get. Look, we don't give just to get because it's not about us. It's all about God's. But when we give from the heart, we'll be blessed. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're a farmer and, and your, your uh, land is not producing, you, you can't necessarily connect the dots and say, well, you're not giving. You may well give to the Lord and go through a time of difficulty. But guess what? God will bless you. God blesses and he blesses and, and, and his faithful ones will never be hungry. And he always provides. There is a blessing when we give to the Lord. Sometimes it is a financial blessing. God is saying here, I I'm chastising you people. You need to understand this is serious enough that I'm withholding the fruit of the land from you. But there are blessings. There are financial blessings, but there are other blessings too when we give. First, there is the blessing of obedience itself. When we obey God, there's a blessing in that. We can put our head on the pillow at night and know, God, I'm obeying you. And there is a blessing in and of the, the act itself. And we have heard testimonies of numbers of people who have responded to what God has called them to do. And you can see in their lives the blessing 
of being obedient. But there's not only the blessing uh, to us of being obedient, but there's also the blessing to others. We can be a blessing to others when we give. When we give, we support others in benevolence and ministry and missions. And we're able to give and release it out of our hands and God uh, blesses that. In, in Malachi's day, their giving, if they would obey and give the tithe, would be a blessing to others. In verse 10, he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that what? There may be food in my house. That wasn't food in their house. It was food in God's house that those who were serving the Lord might be blessed. I have never regretted giving to the Lord. Have you? I've never heard anyone say, I gave to the Lord and I regret giving because you cannot outgive him. So there's the personal blessing of giving too. So we said the blessing of obedience, the blessing to others, but there is just a personal blessing in giving to God. One of the great things is to give and see how God works. Have you ever had time when you thought, man, I'm going to run out of month before I, I run out of, uh, or I'm going to run out of money before I run out of month and God brings a need and you're saying, boy, I better give that. You know, you need to give it. You know, the exciting thing is to see how God provides and he will do it. And it's a personal blessing. Many of us, because we're not generous in our giving, we don't see how God can really work. And we'll look at that in a moment. So is there a financial blessing? Yes, it is. God provides. Sometimes he provides even when we mess up. I got a speeding ticket going to preach a revival. I'd already committed to give the revival money back to the church. But guess what? I got the speeding ticket. I had to pay the speeding ticket too. So even when we disobey, uh, God is still faithful. God's still faithful, but God is calling us here not to presume on that mercy, to, to give and, and to see how he blesses. Those red letter words in Acts chapter 20, verse 35 said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So God's word tells us, as, well, thirdly, when we obediently give, it's a witness to others. When we give to the tithe, I call it the mystery of giving. Unbelievers can't understand how you can give and still have enough and have more than enough. It's a witness. You see, the people in Malachi's day, they were a poor witness. Imagine if you were an unbeliever and you watched these people go in giving sickly animals. They think, well, they must not think much of their God. Imagine if they were observed as you weren't giving a, a tenth and they were saying, well, boy, their God must not be much. But when we give and we give generously, we give obediently, it's a witness uh, for the Lord to others. Look at verse 12. After giving the command, God says, if you do it, then all the nations will consider you fortunate for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now that word delightful carries the idea not of just material blessing, but a delightful people. So we give to God and it's a witness to others. But then fourthly, this is important. Such giving facilitates the proof of God in his word, facilitates. It is a tangible way that God can prove himself. Notice what it says in, in, in verse 10. God says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house. And he says, test me in this way. Some people will say, well, I'm not going to tithe because I'm not under the law. Well, guess what? Abraham gave the tithe, and that was before Moses and the law. Some people will say, well, I'm under grace. I'm not under Old Testament law, so I'm not going to give in such a way. Well, would grace, the return for grace, be any less? It should be more. This is the one I laugh at. Some people say, I make too much money to tithe. I'd like to have their problem. So in other words, follow this. Everything I have is from God. I have so much from God, I can't give back to God. That doesn't make sense. Some people will say I make too little. But God says give what you have, not what you don't have. So it gets to the issue of faith. Does our giving prove that we believe in God, 
Do we allow God to be tested in our giving? And this is tested in a positive way. Yeah, I close with this illustration. There have been a lot of great Christian uh, statesmen and representatives over the past two to three hundred years. I, I think of great preachers uh, like Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I think of great evangelists like Billy Graham or Billy Sunday. But then there's a man named George Mueller. And George Mueller was not famous for messages that he preached. He was not famous for speaking in front of large crowds. If you study George Mueller, he was a man of extreme faith in God. And in his witness, her, his perpetual witness was that he had faith that he could give. And, and he was famous for building orphanages. I think, I want to look at the statistics. He gave away a quarter million Bibles. He was able to get the money to give away a quarter million Bibles, paid tuition for hundreds of children to go to school, gave home in these orphanages to thousands of children, and he died barely with enough money to bury himself. He never asked for a donation. He prayed about it. He didn't go and have a campaign and say, we need this, we need that. He went directly to God and God always provided. And the measure of his faith in God was that he believed that if, if he gave, that God would give what he needed to give. I read this week about Mueller's faith and it was in a different area but not separate really from his giving. It was a daily entry in the devotional streams in the desert. And he was on the waters with a captain and he knew he needed to be in Quebec. And so he told the captain, he said, we need to be there tomorrow. And, and the captain looked out at, at all of the fog and everything. He says, it cannot happen. Look at the clouds. We cannot make it in a day. George Mueller says, I'm not looking at the clouds. I'm looking at the God who controls those clouds. We'll be there. And he said, I'm going to pray. And so Mueller knelt down and he prayed to God and he prayed that God would clear that out, that they would be able to make it Quebec the next day because he had a ministry he needed to carry out. And when he finished praying, the shipmaster began to get on his knees and started to pray. And Mueller put his hand and said, stop. The man was shocked. You're telling me not to pray. What, why are you telling me not to pray? He said, first, because you really don't believe God will do it. And secondly, I prayed and God's already going to do it. And the next day they got up. And guess what? They were headed right to Quebec and they made it. You say, was that just magical faith? No, this man lived a life of dependency on God to provide the material resources that he would be able to give to ministry. Did he die with a lot of toys? No, he didn't. But his impact for the kingdom far exceeded people who kept that money. The scripture says, bring the whole tithe. Test me in this. Test me and let me prove myself. Let's pray. Father, we lift to you today um, this church. And Father, I feel like we're a giving church. But Lord, I don't know. Only you know the hearts. Father, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. Father, we know that when we obey your word, that there's a blessing in the act of obedience, a blessing to others, a personal blessing. We know it's a positive witness. Uh, Father, we know that it demonstrates that you own all. And Father, we especially know too that when we faithfully give, we give you that opportunity, not that you depend on us, but Lord, the opportunity to prove yourself and your faithfulness. Father, give us the faith of a George Mueller who entrusted all that he had into your care, leaning on you each day. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Jesus is worthy of our trust. And uh, uh, George Mueller, at one point in his life, said, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Billy Graham did that. If you're a Christian today, you've done that. You come to the point in your life.